Tonight, we're going to talk about the soil food web. We're going to discuss why you should consider soil a living organism. Okay. And when, we, when I finish, I'm hoping that you'll go away understanding that you need to be taking care of the little guys that are living in the soil. Before COVID, there was an awful lot of information that was going out about the microbiome, what was living in us and on us. COVID sort of took over the airways and we're not hearing quite as much about it just because you now have to be vaccinated and, and just the fact that you're healthy doesn't necessarily protect you against COVID. But a lot of information was coming out about how important it was to keep that microbiome in your body healthy and functioning. Uh, a lot of information about when you took antibiotics and how you had replaced that stuff, how important uh, the bacteria that lives in your colon and your large intestine was. You can kind of see some numbers up here. What we don't sometimes understand is how important this biology is to our functioning. And these microbes are communicating with our bodies. And we have evolved with them and they can tell us things they're telling you when you're hungry they're telling you when you're full they tell me at nine o'clock that it's time for ice cream but we're also finding as we restore this microbiome that we can improve not only our health but our mental health and, and a lot of the mental disorders that we're finding they're going in and they can't cure it with fixing the microbiome, but they're making things manageable for the people. It calms things down. So these microbes are communicating and they're able to talk to our brain. They're able to tell us things. And they're very important for us to keep them alive and healthy. Not only that, but when it's not working right, lots of times people are going to the probiotics. Understand that the best way to kill a microbe is to put it in your stomach. The acid in our stomach will kill bacteria easily. pH of one, battery acid quality. Okay. So it's very difficult for these probiotics to get through the stomach and get into our intestines. In addition, almost everything that lives in our intestine is anaerobic. It will not tolerate an oxygen environment. It's very difficult for them to grow microbes that are anaerobic. They can grow their aerobic ones, and that's what they're putting in the yogurts. And that's why those things aren't working really well for us. So they're trying to encapsulate some of it. They're having trouble with that, and that it's dumping the product in your small intestines where it doesn't work well or it causes problems. Most of those bacteria we need in our colon. So it's hard to get them in from that way. So now they're going the other way. Okay. So they come up from the other end where you have no defense and they do fecal transplants. And you have to be, you cannot be a donor, which sort of surprised me because I would be pretty good at it. But you have to be so healthy to be able to donate because we're, there's no defensive system when it comes up the other way. But when they do this, it's very, very effective at curing whatever they're going after. Cronin's disease, some of the irritable bowel syndromes, uh, lots of things that they're working with. We can manipulate the biology in our colon if we come up from the other way. And it's a new way that athletes are starting to dope. So that if we have a guy who's a champion, they're finding that he's got a different microbiome than the guys that are fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth. And they're actually starting to use his biology, go up the other way and dope themselves. And they can improve their performances up to 10% just by getting a fecal transplant. And there's no way they'll ever be able to tell that these guys are doping that way. Be safe. So the same thing exists in our soils. Matter of fact, the same thing exists almost anywhere you go. You go inside a plant, you go inside a tree. We've got a microbiome in there. 
Okay. But we have a microbiome in the soil. And we call it the soil food web. And this brilliant doctor is probably the first guy that introduced you to this concept. Okay. So small, we can't see it, can't hear it, but incredibly important to the plants that we're growing in our soils. They're dependent on, these, on the microbes that are in the soil to provide them with fertilizer, to provide them with nutrients, to provide them with water. Let's look at some numbers. <clears throat> these numbers are species, and that's not a misspelled thing there. It's number of species in a tablespoon of good, healthy soil. If you're an organic gardener, this is what you have in your garden. If, you're, if you've got a mature forest out there, this is what you have in that soil. Incredible numbers. Those are species. Some more numbers, okay? A cup of soil, 200 billion bacteria, okay? Bacteria are so small that if we took a printed period in your program, we could put 250,000 of the big guys. We can put 500,000 bacteria on a single period and still have wiggle room. So we're talking very, very small stuff. Okay. Now, one of the things we don't even pay attention to are protozoa. I don't know how many of you have ever even discussed protozoa in your soil, but almost 80, up to 80% of the nitrogen that is picked up by your plants has to be processed through a protozoa before it is available to the plant. So they're incredibly important to us in growing plants, growing crops, growing our gardens. And what this is, is it forms what we call a soil food web. And it's a web because everybody's eating everybody. This is not some chain where we have a top predator and it's coming down. Everybody's eating everybody. There is no safe place. Nobody in this soil in the microbiome lives to old age. They either die because conditions change and it's not good for them to live or somebody eats them. Okay. So the basis of this web are bacteria. And for tonight's discussion, I'm gonna include archaea with bacteria. And for you, those of you who don't know what archaea are, they are the same size as bacteria, same shape as bacteria. They're a completely different organism. They tend to be the extremophiles. So the things that you hear about bacteria in the oceans at the hot water vents, those are archaea. Okay. The stuff that's living in the bubbling mud in, in uh, Yellowstone, those are archaeas. The stuff that's at the bottom of them, of ice or, or in these extreme environments in the middle of a piece of granite. Those are archaeas most of the time. They're completely different from bacteria, but because you and I can't tell the difference, I'm going to include archaea every time I say bacteria. So bacteria form the basis of this soil food web. They are one of the main ways that things are broken down and made available. Uh, everything in this soil food web not only is eating everything, but you have to understand that all of us are surviving on the waste of something, okay? Uh, and when bacteria consume stuff and, and poop out what they can't use, then that is coming out in a form that a plant can use and pick up. It's also coming out in a form that other bacteria can pick up and use. It's coming out in a form that fungi can pick up and use. And so none of these products that are coming out of the bacteria go away. Somebody's picking them up. Somebody's using them again. But it's the bacteria that are able to put out enzymes. And, and these little guys can put out sometimes 500 to 1,000 different types of enzymes. They don't have a stomach. They feed outside of their own body. 
They put out these enzymes that dissolve things, that break things down into basic elements, and then they're able to absorb those things through their cell membrane. Okay. And that's how they eat. And then when they had stuff, they use what they can, and then they poop out what they can't use. Or they die, and they, the, those products become available to whatever's there. And bacteria contain everything that is necessary for life. So it's not that they're just picking up nitrogen or something. If there's amino acid, if there's uh, an enzyme that has to be used to, for life to function, the bacteria has it. The bacteria put out a product called biofilm. It's intended to be a way that they protect themselves. It tends to be a glue so that this biofilm not only will protect groups of bacteria, but it can also help the bacteria attract pieces of soil, pieces of organic matter to help make themselves a little bit bigger, maybe a little bit less likely to be consumed. But this biofilm forms small, small microscopic aggregates of soil of products. And those aggregates are very, very important in the movement of air and water in the soil. And it's one of the things that we tend to destroy as we work our soils. So biofilm is a little bit on, on the pH side, it's a little bit uh, alkaline, but it's, it's how we form these little micro aggregates of stuff that keeps the soil functioning, keeps the air moving, keeps water moving in the soil. Fungi are sort of on the next level. Um, they kind of do the same thing. They have an acid that they put out that will dissolve things, uh, able to dissolve rocks and minerals and, and break that stuff down. They are the main Break, they break down most of the organic matter that's in the soil. Fungi, bacteria are able to break down uh, cellulose, but they cannot break down lignin. Fungi can break down lignin and cellulose. So they're going to be the main way that things are recycled in the soil. They put out a product called guamelin, and it's also a glue, and it's meant to be a, a way that they repair their cell walls when those things get broken. Okay. But this glomalin can do the same thing in that it can attract, uh, it can glue things together and make these little micro aggregates of stuff that keeps the soil loose, keeps air moving, keeps water moving. And again, these are the things we destroy absolutely destroy when we till the soil, when we turn the soil, when we plow the soil. It's the reason that once you plow or till, that after a little while that soil sinks down and it becomes compacted again and you have to till it again. It's because you're destroying these little micro aggregates that are keeping the soil loose. Protozoa are kind of the next level. And these are the guys that are coming in and eating bacteria. They don't do much with eating. And, and I'll say eating, it's consuming because nothing, nothing, they don't have a mouth. They're doing the same thing. They're absorbing stuff and breaking it down and then using what they need and what they don't need, they poop out. And that product coming out is in a form that plant roots can pick up. It's in a form that other biology in the soil can pick up and use. Okay. The acid is, our, our, the protozoa are, are different sizes. Uh, they're able to, they need a little bit looser soil. They need a little bit more room in order to function. Some of the really small ones can function even in compacted soil, but the big guys, the amoebas, like you learned about in school, need a fairly good soil in order to move around. But they're Moving through, they're picking up bacteria, mostly bacteria. An amoeba can eat about 10,000 bacteria a day. But if you look at bacteria, if we had a single bacteria and we had ideal conditions, 
plenty of food, nice temperature. In 12 hours, we would have 5 billion bacteria. Okay. So very, very rapid reproduction, but also a lot of them are being consumed or dying or would be <coughs> overwhelmed with bacteria. So the protozoa, some of them have a flagella, and supposedly that's so they can swim. I've seen some videos of them moving through the soil. And this guy was actually taking that flagella and stretching it out and wrapping it around a soil product, a piece of soil, and pulling himself through the soil, which sort of surprised me. But he could reach out, grab things, and pull himself. He also, or maybe she, got to a spot, another video, a little bit more moisture in the soil, taking that flagella, stretching it out, and it was corkscrewing it back down. And the water would flow, and you just see the bacteria flowing right into it. So consuming tremendous amount of bacteria, but also pooping out lots of product. And this product, again, is what our plants are picking up as fertilizer, as nutrients. And then there's nematodes. And nematodes are a sightless worm, again, microscopic. Every once in a while, there'll be one big enough that if you look really closely in a water solution, you could see it. But pretty much microscopic, doing kind of the same thing. They tend to eat lots of bacteria, but also they're eating fungi, and some of them are eating other nematodes. And they're doing the same kind of thing. They're eating these bacteria, using what they need. Everything necessary for life is in a bacteria, pooping out what they don't need. And that product is coming out with a plus or a minus charge. And that's what plants are picking up for their nutrients. And then as we get into the big guys, also microscopic, but there's a bunch of mites. And you've heard the... I don't know, the pillow mattress commercials where they're talking about dust mites and they scare you to death. Same kind of guys, same kind of size, uh, but they're in the soil. Again, they need something that's a little, they, they're doing lots of tunneling. So they're making tunnels and they're, they're moving soil around and making things loose, allowing water and air to move in the soil. These guys don't eat bacteria because they're, they're just too big for that. They're the guys eating the protozoa, eating the fungi, are, are eating the nematodes, and then again, pooping out what they don't need and making it available to plants. So this forms kind of the soil food web on the microscopic level. We could go on up and get into bigger things, get into springtails and worms and that, that sort of thing, but... Today, I, I'm just going to limit to the micro guys, but they're forming soil structure, and it's on a microscopic level, and this is what's keeping our soil loose and keeping water and air moving where we want it to. The cool thing to me as an arborist is the tree, and I'll, I'll talk tree. You guys can talk broccoli if you want to, or, or you can talk one, one of your natives. Trees are totally, completely in charge of the system. They rule the roost because only a plant can provide the carbon that everything in the soil is functioning. Everything that's living there requires carbon. And nobody can put it into the soil. Nobody can process it except the plant. And that plant is able to take the carbon, make sugar with it, it makes a whole bunch more sugar than it needs. And it purposely leaks carbon sugars out of its root system to feed these guys. And it is purposely feeding the bacteria, purposely feeding the fungi that are in the area around the root. And it can change, the, and we call these exudates, but it can change these exudates according to what it needs. If it needs iron, it'll put out an exudate that encourages the fungi or the bacteria that can get iron and, and bring it to the plant and make it available to it. If it's hot, it'll put out a different exudate. If it's cold, different, wet, 
dry, it changes what it's leaking out of its root system to benefit the microorganism that can provide what it needs. Completely in charge of it. There's an area around the root that we call the rhizosphere. And it is where most of the, where these exudates are being leaked out and fed to the biology that's right there. Right around that root, right around the expanded root, <clears throat> tremendous amount of biological activity. And th this picture I like. I don't know what I did. <laughs> okay. Push, punch the wrong button. Because you can see this. this these are bacteria. Just a cloud of bacteria. These are some of the fungi that are coming out. But look how much bacteria we have around this root hair. Okay. And the plant is purposely feeding them. When they're here, these are good guys. The bad guys can't get to that root. The bad guys can't get to the exudates. Okay. These bacteria are completely dominating and keeping all the bad guys out. The same thing with these fungi. They are protecting this root hair. They're doing it because they want the exudates that are coming out. But they're keeping the bad fungi away. They're keeping the bad nematodes away. They're keeping the bad guys away from having access to the roots. It's sort of like pigs in a feeding trough. You guys are country, so I can use a pig. Deal, but there's, just, there's no room for anybody. The pigs just crowd in and eat, right? So a bad pig can't get in there. So these bacteria, these fungi are doing the same thing. When you protect them, you are keeping your plants healthy. So that's called the rhizosphere. So the, the system is this. We've got a protozoa here consuming bacteria, pooping out ammonium. And ammonium is the form of nitrogen that a tree prefers. Almost any plant that lives for a long time prefers its nitrogen in the ammonium form. The plants that you're growing in your garden, your broccoli, your beans, prefer the nitrogen in a nitrate form. And there's a difference, and, and plants can survive on one or the other, but they prefer to have uh, the nitrogen that they like the best. But not only is it pooping out ammonium, it's pooping out anything that's necessary for life. And it's coming out in a form that the plant can pick it at. And it's coming out right here in the rhizosphere. So that if another microbe doesn't pick it up, the plant root picks it up. And it's the best way to fertilize your plants. Some of these compounds get processed through these microbes many times. As you can, you know, they're coming out and somebody else is picking them up pretty quick and, and utilizing them. And, and the, some of them get built up to where they're fairly complicated molecules. And you know those as humus and humates. But all they are is a very complicated form of where carbon is being put in with other stuff. They, the humates and the humus do not readily break down. They're very stable in the soil. And it's a great way of improving uh, your soil quality. And then there's some really cool fungi, okay? We call them mycorrhizae. They are associated with the plant root. They will not survive without the plant root. And generally, the plant doesn't survive well without the mycorrhizae. Every time we've taken a tree and we've tried to trans, we take it down to South America, we couldn't get them to live there, and the soils were perfect for them. But once they started growing them here with their mycorrhizae association, they could take them down there and transplant them, and they did fine. But the tree did not know how to feed the mycorrhizae that were in the new location. So we, the, the mycorrhizae are pretty important. We've got two kinds. One is called ecto, and it's on the outside. One in my school days was called endo, and I liked 
ecto endo because I can remember out and in. They've now changed endo to arbuscular. I think endo was too easy to say. Uh, and, and the reason for it to become arbuscular is if you look at the structure microscopically, it looks like a tree. So they named it arbor. Okay, arbuscular. I will still use the term endo and ecto. And, and what's cool is that trees tend to have the ecto. Almost all of them, except for some of the really soft wooded trees, ecto is their preferred way. Where the, the plants, the grasses, the stuff you're growing in your gardens, in your vegetable gardens, the stuff in some of your landscape tend to be these endo uh, mycorrhizae. And all they are is they're able to penetrate through the cell wall and establish themselves inside that zone. And then they're dumping the nutrients that they pick up. They're dumping them right there at the cell. And then the cell is exit, putting out exudates that they can pick up. So it's a trading system. We've got the sugar daddy, which is our tree. And we've got these other guys that are just desperate for that carbon desperate for that sugar. They go out and pick up water and phosphorus and all the other nutrients, bring them to the tree, trade them for carbon sugar. This is kind of what a cell wall looks like. So even though we call it a wall, it's not much of a wall. It's sort of, the other day I had someone explain to me finally that an egg, the egg yolk is a single cell which I didn't realize. Okay. And so that kind of gives me a neat picture of a cell where we've kind of got this egg yolk with a, a membrane around it, single cell, and then the shell is kind of the cell wall. And all of us, I don't, if you raise chickens, you know that you don't wash the eggs when you bring them into the house, right? Because the water will go through that shell, even though it looks like it's solid. Okay. And also air is moving through there. So carbon dioxide and oxygen are moving through that shell. Sort of the same thing with a plant cell. Uh, it's easy on the microscopic level for things to move through the cell wall. Really easy. But nothing gets inside the plant cell that doesn't go through the cell membrane. And that really is, it scrutinizes carefully what it lets in. So... The mycorrhizae fungi are able to go out, pick up these nutrients. They break things down with their acids, bring them to the cell in exchange for the carbon sugars. And by the way, the mycorrhizae also have this association with them. They actually have bacteria that travel along with the mycorrhizae. And a lot of them are the nitrogen fiction by uh, bacteria. But everybody seems to have a microbiome. If you have trouble spelling mycorrhizae, okay, I can't help you a lot, but this, most of you are old enough to remember the old Mickey Mouse song, you know, M-I-C-K-E-Y, M-Y-C-O-R-R-H-I-Z-A-E. You may not get the right number, but you get the right number of letters if you do that. Okay, okay but incredibly important. And, and most of the phosphorus that is picked up that is in your plant has been processed through a mycorrhizae and almost 95 to they keep up in the number it was 90 it's 95 it's probably about 98 percent of all plants have a mycorrhizae association okay plants evolved where my where fungus was already in the soil they didn't have to develop the systems to break things down in the soil because these fungi could provide it for them. So they developed a system to feed the fungi and let them go out and do all the work. Okay. So this sort of shows you an arbuscular. And you can see how it looks like a tree. And you can also see in these mycorrhizae how much it expands the root system of the plant. Incredible expansion when the mycorrhizae are working. And the mycorrhizae are very small, much, much smaller than a root hair. Okay. Able to go out and work in really small pore spaces, work in real fine areas, work way beyond 
on a microscopic level, way beyond the root hair. And so it gives the, the plant a whole bunch more area that they're utilizing. And that's not the only cool thing about mycorrhizae. Okay. Mycorrhizae will attach, they're not very particular. They will attach to almost any plant. You'll have the same mycorrhizae attached to an oak tree that's attached to your agarita. It's attached to your Texas persimmon. Okay. And this system will communicate underground through the mycorrhizae system. It will share resources. So the old thing, and it's not very old, but where we were so concerned about spacing trees and making sure we had, they weren't too close together because they were competing with each other. It's not true. They don't compete. They compete for space upstairs. They don't compete for water. They don't compete for uh, nutrients. They share those products with each other. And it's through the mycorrhizae system that they're sharing these resources. So if we have a tree that's up on a hill and one that's down in the valley, and this guy's got a lot of water, and this guy's stressed, water's going to move up to the mycorrhizae system to help water the guy upstairs. Okay. Not only that, and, and we know this because they're taking radioisotopes, they're taking special forms of carbon, putting, putting the tin around the tree, putting that product into that tree, and then they're watching that product move through the system. Okay. And they can see it attached, the oak tree attached to the agarita. And they can see the nutrients being shared because these other, these radioisotopes are moving through the system into the other plants. Okay. We now know that if you are a seed off the big tree, she will share more resources with you than she will with the other plants that are attached. She can recognize her own seed. And one of the cool things that's just happened is they found out with global warming, with, with climate change, that if we have a group, a species of trees that are not tolerating an area and they're dying, they will share their resources with a different species. They will not share their resources with the same species. They're moving their resources into another plant that can tolerate the change. So I, I don't know that we can call it intelligent, but it's incredibly intelligent. It's, it's amazing what they're doing. These mycorrhizae, we're looking at how small they are. They're very delicate. They're very easy for us to destroy. And the reason you don't have them in your garden is because you're tilling and turning your soil and you're tearing these guys up all the time. And, and you know, in the case of broccoli, where we're putting it in and it's like, you know, six, uh, six weeks later we're harvesting, it's not a big deal. But for a tree or for a landscape plant, uh, that's going to be there for a long time. It's important that you don't damage the mycorrhizae. We're not finished with mycorrhizae. The fungi in the soil, we, we talked about everything is eating everything. These fungi are able to put out a snare. This is the snare. They put out a nematode attractant. They bait their trap. When the nematode comes in, this snare closes and kills the nematode, and it closes in a tenth of a second. Kills the nematode. Then it grows a special structure that penetrates the nematode, injects its acid, its enzymes, dissolves everything inside the nematode, consumes that, consumes those groceries, uses what it needs, takes the rest of the plant. <clears throat> trades it for carbon sugar. There are fungi that put out these snare traps. There are fungi that put out glue traps. And there are fungi, <coughs> are, are there, I'm sorry. Yeah, and, and there are fungi that can put out poisons so that when the nematode comes to bite on it, it gets a piece of poison, dies. The fungi is able to, almost like a rattlesnake follows the heat trail to the mouse that it's taken, 
The fungi follows that nematode to where it's died, grows that special structure, dissolves the groceries, shares it with the plant. Oh, yeah. And that's what we say. Everybody's eating everybody. Nobody lives to old age. Nobody, the, the reason we don't know how old the bacteria can be is they all get killed before we know how long they can live. Yeah. Okay, so that is the soil food web. And, and as we finish today, I'm hoping you will start regarding your soil as a living organism that you'll really start thinking about how do I protect these little guys and, and what I'm doing. We, you know, it's sort of like your micro, the microbiome in your gut. You can't always not use an antibiotic. You got to figure out how to restore it, how to get it coming back. We need to do the same thing with our gardens, with our native plants. We need to consider how we keep those guys working for us. Okay, I'm not going to talk too much about other things with the soil. I, I I consider dirt to be chemical. Everything in dirt is chemical reactions. I consider soil to be biology. Everything in soil is biology working for us. And we've had this misconception that the soil is doing nutrients. It's, it's doing the chemical stuff. What we're learning is it's the biology in the soil that's doing all of that. And the dirt's getting credit for it. Okay, but there is a nitrogen cycle. And we are completely, you know, 80% of what is around us is nitrogen. And you can't use a bit of it. Your plant can't use a bit of it. The microbes in general can't use much of it. Nitrogen is N2 in the air. Two nitrogen molecules bonded together. And most atoms bond with a single bond. There are some atoms that bond with a double bond. Nitrogen is an atom that bonds with a triple bond. Okay. And what that means is it's very inert. It's very difficult to break apart. It's why fertilizer is an explosive. Because what it is is they've broken that nitrogen bond and they've got you with somebody, something else. But that triple bond is incredibly energetic. And it's why they can blow up the, you know, the building in uh, Oklahoma with just nitrogen fertilizer. But N2 is almost impossible for it. Lightning can break it sometimes, but almost nothing else will but bacteria will. Bacteria are able to produce an enzyme that will break the nitrogen bond. And what we need for nitrogen to do to be available to our plants is either to combine with the oxygen or to combine with hydrogen so that we can make it available to the plant. And, and the biology in the soil is able to take and break that bond and get it to bond with some other materials so that the plant can pick it up. The N2 is broken down initially into NH4, which is ammonium. Okay. And again, that is the form of nitrogen that the trees prefer. It's stuff that lives a long time. I said it gets big. Grass prefers nitrate. It can live a long time. But generally things that get big and live a long time like NH4. And the reason is that to convert from nitrate back to NH4 so the plant can use it takes a, another energy step. And so the tree would prefer not to have to use that energy. So it wants its nitrogen in the ammonium form. There are other bacteria that can take this NH4, take the ammonium, and convert it to nitrite. And nitrite is toxic. It is almost not, it's not used by almost anything that I know of. So, that, but there are other bacteria that take this nitrite and convert it to nitrate. And nitrate is what farmers want to know. They want, that's the product that their crops use. If you're getting soil testing done, I, all soil tests come back telling you how much nitrate is in the soil. 
as an arborist, that doesn't do me a bit of good. Okay. I need to know how much ammonium is in the soil. But also, those soil tests do not tell you how much material is contained in the bacteria and the fungi that are in the soil. And we call that, when a bacteria picks it up, we call that that it's immobilized. And when it's been released from the bacteria or from the fungi, uh, then we call it mobilized. And so what you're not finding out with your soil test is how much stuff, how much product is in your microbiome. And to me, that is the most important thing. So what's happening is we're over-fertilizing everything. There's a whole bunch more nitrogen in the soil than you think from your soil test. So most of the time, if you think about the redwood forest, who's fertilizing those? Nobody. So that the leaves that are falling, the microbes that are working in the soil provide enough nitrogen to grow a 300 foot plus tall tree. Right? We're way over fertilizing stuff. I'm going to throw this in just for grins, but this is compaction and it's our worst enemy. When I'm dealing with soil, when I'm dealing with trying to keep a tree healthy, this is my biggest problem, compaction. And until the airspace came around, we had almost no solution for this, no quick solution. Airspades have sort of changed that for us a little bit, but most people would not allow a bulldozer to park under the tree, but they don't care if the guy parks his pickup there because right? he doesn't want a hot pickup when he leaves at three o'clock. So you let it, but he's doing a whole bunch more compaction under the tree than the bulldozer does. It's sort of like your little 10 pound dog running the fence line. You can't grow grass in that path. Yeah, that's compaction. And it does, as long as it's a small footprint, it doesn't take much weight to really compact the soil to where it won't, it won't support plant growth. And pickup trucks, are, if, if I had another deal, I wish I had one that showed skid loaders. Because nobody, if, if I'm dealing with construction product, uh, construction, nobody does more damage to the tree than the landscaper. Nobody, not even close, okay? It's not even, the bulldozer guy doesn't even come close to the damage that the landscaper does. All roots are in the top 12 inches of soil, if you have 12 inches, right? Or the top three inches. The guy that puts in the irrigation system, puts a 12-inch trench in, he cuts every root on the tree. The skid loader comes in, he does this kind of compaction, plus he's skidding. So he's ripping the soil up, and he does a whole bunch more damage than the bulldozer did. So we are doing a lot of preaching to the landscapers. And when I'm on a construction project, it's the landscaper that I want to be there for, because he, he's the guy that's going to tear it. He's the guy that's going to kill my tree. He's the guy that two years later, after they've left, the tree falls over. Okay, that's, that was for free. The other thing that I think is cool is water. And I, I, I don't think we appreciate how cool water is and what it does. Okay. So water, hydrogen, oxygen, the hydrogen has a positive charge. It tends to be on one side of the oxygen molecule, sort of the Mickey Mouse look. Okay. But this polarizes a water molecule. So we get kind of a plus, plus charge at one end and a minus charge at, one, at the other end. And so water attracts, and this is not a good picture, but water attracts water molecules very well. This is a much better picture. We get this chain, okay? and, and it's a pretty good bond. It's not perfect, but it's not bad. And when it's water to water, we call it cohesion. When it's water to something else, we call it adhesion. And it's very important in that, a 300-foot tree, we used to say, it's impossible for a tree to get that tall because water can't move up the xylem tubes 300 feet. How does it happen? Okay. It happens because when this water molecule evaporates, and we call it transpiration, from the leaf of the tree, it pulls the next water molecule up. And that happens all 300 feet. 
Everything is pulling the water molecule up. The tree extends zero energy, moving water from the ground 300 feet. Wish we could do that, right? It also is really good about adhering to the side of something. So your rain gauge, you get this look in your rain gauge, right? So what we have is we've got water that's adhering to the side of the rain gauge, and then it's cohering to itself, and it forms that meniscus. And sometimes it does this. But it's why at night when transpiration shuts down, that xylem tube, that water conducting tube, does not drain because of gravity. Water is being held up in each one of those tubes, cohesion, adhesion. And then in the morning, when it starts transpiring again, it just starts moving all the water and pulling it up just like a rope, just like a chain. So really cool. And this is also one of the things that we used to make a lot of mistakes with this, is that soil, because of this cohesion, adhesion property of water, water will not move from one distinct type of soil into another one until it's totally, completely saturated and has nowhere to go. And I know in my day, we used to build drainage systems before we planted a tree. We'd put sand in the bottom, we'd put gravel in the bottom, and then we'd plant our tree we didn't mend the soil. And what we were doing is we were making things so different that water wasn't moving from around the tree into these other systems until it was totally saturated. And we were ending up with this, we called it the swimming pool effect. We were drowning our trees, even though we had gravel underneath them. The water would not drain into the gravel until... This area was totally saturated. And if what you have is a tree ball here and then you've amended this soil, you're even having more of a problem with the water moving out. So it's why the new recommendations are when you plant a tree, do not amend the soil, unless you just have terrible soil. Okay. Put the same soil back in that you had. Dig a shallow hole so that we're not backfilling, we're not tramping down, we're not putting the drainage system in underneath it. We want it on a solid platform, up high, two inches high if possible, with the same soil all around. Okay. Where we get into trouble with that is the soil that they call soil that's around the tree when we plant it isn't really very good soil, but um, we, we can still have an issue with this. But the more that these products are the same or the more that we get a gradual change from clay to sand, then we, we're likely to get drainage. This was the new calendar from the concerned scientists uh, that just put it out, but I thought that was kind of cute. Uh, that the worst thing we can do to our soils is to plow, disc them, okay? and to do it over and over. And then to, if we throw in the chemical stuff, uh, chemical fertilizers, all the, the sprays they're putting on, we're destroying the microbiome, we're destroying that microscopic food web, and we're destroying those little micro aggregates of soil and whatever the bacteria and the fungi have glued together. And then you'll see that soil slowly sink and compact. And then pretty soon that farmer is getting a bigger plow because he's got to plow a little bit deeper. And then he's getting a bigger plow and going a little bit deeper because things are compacting, compacting, compacting. Money. He's losing his nutrients. When we do this, we're exposing all that carbon that's in the soil. We're exposing it to the air. It's going up as carbon dioxide, and it's leaving the soil. And everything in the soil depends on the carbon that's there. There's something like 30%, 33% of the carbon dioxide that's currently in the atmosphere right now is because of farming practices. Right? So if, all we'd have to do is, you'll never get it to happen because farmers farm because daddy did it and grandpa did it and great grandpa did it. Uh, but if they would get to where they're 
covering their soils when they don't have a crop on it and they're, and they're reducing the amount of plowing they're doing, we would see a drastic drop in the carbon that's in the air. Okay, so take away, eat for your microbiome, take care of the microbes that are in your soil, do as little disturbance as possible, keep your soil covered. You should never see your soil. If you never saw your soil, it would be the healthiest soil you could have. Okay. Take good care of it. And, and, you know, we still have to dig a hole to plant. plant. I understand that. And so you're going to do some damage when you do it. If it's in your garden, you're doing it all the time. But do what you can to keep the microbiome as healthy as possible. Keep things covered. Keep things, keep cover crops over over the area. Keep leaves on it if you, if you can't do anything else, but keep it covered. Okay, so takeaway is I want you to farm microbes. Take really good care of the guys you can't see. And what you're going to find is you're going to be able to sit back on your patio like I do now. Drink coffee, and when the wife says, what are you doing? I said, I'm gardening. Because <laughs> the microbiome in my garden is healthy and it's working for me. It's fertilizing my plants. It's bringing water to my plants. And I'm enjoying a nice cup of coffee. This talks about some stuff. If you want to know a little bit more about mycorrhizae, Suzanne Samar, doctor now, uh, she's got TED Talks. She's got... Uh, these radio lab things, she's doing, I think she's got a book out now, um, but did some interesting stuff. And the book that got me going is this one, Kristen Olson's The Soil Will Save Us, uh, which I highly recommend. Really good one. And then go through the, Jeff Lowenfels has done not only teaming with microbes, but teaming with fungi, teaming with nutrients. And this is an easy read, and he gets a little bit more technical in the, the fungi book, and he gets really technical in the nutrient book. Uh, so give those a read. And take care of your microbes. Thank you.